I'm Carl McNair, and I am the CEO of McNair Achievement Programs, LLC, here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm also President Emeritus of the Dr. Ronald McNair Foundation, which was named in honor of my brother, NASA astronaut, Dr. Ronald E. McNair, who perished aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986. Now, why am I involved with the forum? I wanted to see this to come to fruition because I wanted McNair Scholar alums to collaborate with other scholars and African Americans in particular to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the black community. And the second reason and equally as important is to develop solutions. And I emphasize solutions to address the effects of COVID-19 on our beloved community. I am most grateful to Linnell Williams, who is our Ronald McNair Scholar Harvard University PhD candidate for raising her hand for facilitating this. And I'm also grateful to her mentor, uh, that's Dr. Trina Coleman, uh, who is also a Hampton University alum, and all the panelists who are here this afternoon who are participating. Why are we here once again? We want to be proactive. There are so many things that are plaguing the African American community, and therefore it made it very important to assemble a group of distinguished scholars like this in order to start answering some of these things as opposed to being reactive. Again, thank you, and we'll talk more this evening. Well, I am Dr. Trina Coleman. Uh, I wear many hats. Uh, one of them is an entrepreneur. I'm the CEO of my own company, Coleman Comprehensive Solutions. I am a PhD physicist. As Carl said, I am a graduate of Hampton University. And um, I'm also the host of Beyond the Classroom on HBCU Nation Radio. And now we have our streaming television on uh, Roku and Amazon Fire Stick. I am here because, uh, Carl dragged me, no, I'm just kidding. I'm here because I am concerned about uh, the COVID-19 impact on the black community as well, particularly um, as it impacts our HBCUs. And um, as well as being able to take this forum and uh, the other panel series and have them have a home on HBCU Nation because right now there are lots of different panels going on and people are talking about COVID and, and black community and this and that, but they're all scattered all over the place. So what this is gonna start for us at HBCU Nation is to start bringing the information to a place where people can access it. So it'll be on demand. And those who may not have seen it today will have somewhere to go and see it. And then we can network from there. But Linnell has done a fantastic job of pulling this together and we're about to get it started. Hello, I'm Linnell Williams. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate at Harvard University in the physics department. Um, I study virus self-assembly and I became a part of this project because I, again, really care about the black community um, and the ways in which uh, these sort of, this sort of double pandemic in a way, the pandemic of racism and the pandemic um, that we currently see with um, COVID-19 is affecting the African African American community. Um, I personally have seen um, the effects happen in my own family and within the people around me. Um, and so when, when Carl reached out, um, I was definitely on board in, in trying to do this. And so the purpose of our full form, so the uh, series that we're having um, over the next couple of weeks is to talk about um, the impact of these uh, two events on the black community in a very thoughtful way um, and in a very interdisciplinary way as well. Um, and we also wanna make sure that we're giving enough time to the various things that are affecting us. So the purpose of this panel today is to really focus in on the sort of public health um, science um, impacts um, of uh, COVID-19 in addition to the way that um, BLM might also be in the mix, the politics surrounding BLM might also be in the mix and affecting our, our uh, mental and physical health um, in particular. I'm excited uh, that we're doing this today and I'm ready to introduce our panelists um, and allow them to introduce themselves. Let's first start with um, Professor Olivia Prosper. 
Hi, well, thank you again, Linnell, for the invitation to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm Olivia Prosper. I'm a mathematics professor at the University of Tennessee. Um, I earned my PhD from University of Florida, did a postdoc at Dartmouth College, um, was an assistant professor for a few years at the University of Kentucky before um, coming to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, my research, broadly speaking, is in mathematical biology. Um, my, more specifically, I model infectious disease dynamics, and a lot of my work has been related to modeling of malaria dynamics, um, which is spread by mosquitoes. And I'm interested in how things like uh, variations in transmission across space and movement of individuals between different regions influences those dynamics and the decisions that we make about control. And I'm also interested in topics about um, variations in the pathogens themselves and how that also influences control decisions. Dr. Keishana Taylor. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Keishana Taylor. I um, got my PhD from UGA in Interdisciplinary Biomedical Sciences in 2018. Um, and I'm currently um, wrapping up a postdoc at University of California, Davis, uh, in researching influenza uh, evolutionary <laughs> dynamics. Um, and I'm getting ready to start a second uh, postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University, um, looking at um, the role of macrophages and how and what they what role they play in um, SARS coronavirus infection, so COVID infection. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Chiquita May. Hi, I'm Dr. Chiquita Mays, and my doctorate is in industrial and organizational psychology. And I like to say I'm a professional problem solver and strategist. I'm a degreed electrical engineer from North Carolina A&T State University, and I was a Ronald McNair scholar there. Um, and I specialize in, I own a consulting firm, and I specialize in helping organizations through organizational development and change behaviors. I am currently serving on the COVID-19 task force for the largest health system in the state of Georgia. Uh, so I have a special interest mm -hmm. in this topic as well. And I'll say this, so today I had the unfortunate opportunity to bury a loved one due to COVID-19. So um, this thing has hit very close to home on today. Awesome, thank you. Dr. Andrew Marsh Marshall. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm, my name is Andrew Marshall. I'm a graduate of Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama, and a graduate of Meharry Medical College. Uh, I did my emergency medicine training on the south side of Chicago before uh, coming to Boston to do a clinical informatics fellowship at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. I'm currently an emergency medicine attending at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and a bioinformatics research training fellow at Harvard Med School. Um, my current areas of research include addressing social determinants of health in the emergency department, uh, also looking uh, at the data to analyze the, uh, the effect of crisis standards of care on different populations, uh, making sure that there's no discrimination, and uh, looking at the historical effects of red lighting on communities uh, adversely affected by COVID-19. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Professor Johnson. Hi everyone, my name is Michael Johnson. I got my PhD in biochemistry and biophysics from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I went on to do two postdoctoral fellowships at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, one in infectious disease and one in immunology. I am currently an assistant professor in the Department of Immunobiology at the University of Arizona. Uh, there I wear uh, many hats, uh, one is running a uh, uh, a research program where I basically study molecular microbiology. Specifically, I look at how metals impact microbes. Uh, if you've heard a lot about copper, uh, that's actually the metal that I study. I also uh, run a postdoctoral fellowship mentoring program, uh, grant and mentoring program, and I also run a uh, newly formed uh, uh, national program matching undergraduates to uh, research opportunities, trying to be like a uh, Carl McNair, you know, and I've had uh, some, uh, a lot of those uh, students in the program as well, which has been uh, absolutely outstanding. Awesome, thank you. And last but not least, Deborah Levins. 
I'm sorry to hear about your family member, Dr. Mays. Uh, my name is Deborah Levins. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Massachusetts. I started my therapy career at a level one trauma hospital where I worked with people who lost loved ones to homicide. I was also working there at the time of the Boston Marathon bombing. So I worked with people who were impacted by those bombings as well. And then I started working in college university settings. Most recently before my current position, I was at Harvard University. And right now I'm the Associate Director of Counseling Services at Lesley University. I also teach, lecture, and consult around traumatic loss, trauma, traumatic grief, working across difference, and anti-racist, anti-oppressive therapeutic practices. Awesome, thank you guys for introducing yourselves. Um, so I guess we can get started. Um, first, I wanna begin by starting a conversation about what kind of brought us here and that's COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement and what led up those to those uh, events. And so uh, for our audience, especially like what is COVID-19 and, and what, are, what are the events, um, you know, both previous and current that um, you understand up to this point that led to the current health pandemic that we see specifically for, for COVID-19? So COVID-19 uh, is a, it's a virus that uh, we are trying our best to understand how it works, how it progresses, how it spreads, how it stays asymptomatic, how it does all of these things. Uh, and we're learning all of this in real time. So you're, it's, it's kind of amazing. You're seeing the scientific process in real time. And unfortunately, sometimes the scientific process is messy. Like we, we get new information and we change our mind. That's just how it works. Um, you know, we're understanding how this virus uh, affects our immune system and how it affects other organs uh, that, you know, we need to survive. And a lot of the information we won't know until later, uh, because that's actually when the, uh, the, 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 the things will manifest themselves. Uh, it's been a difficult thing to combat because there's a lot of misinformation out there in real time as well. So, you know, I think that, you know, the people on this panel, you know, uh, you know, as far as mental health, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, and being in the clinic and working on cures and working on, you know, things, you know, of how your immune system combats this, we're all trying to really, you know, do our part to try and combat this particular virus together. And, you know, a lot of us, which I don't know that people completely understand is, you know, I'm a bacteriologist. I'm now working on COVID-19 research. A lot of us are trying to, you know, pivot ourselves to, you know, to meet the challenges of this particular global health pandemic. Uh, and, you know, at the sacrifice of maybe our careers or, you know, or, you know, personal lives, you know, a lot of us have kids at home and, you know, I'm very fortunate to be able to work in science and have this ability to do this, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a major issue. <laughs> it's a, that's what COVID-19 is. It's a major issue. And I agree completely with Dr. Johnson. Um, one of the things with this pandemic is that the data has been outpaced by the spread of COVID-19. Um, we were learning, the disease was spreading faster almost than it seemed that we were learning and even mapping out a, a strategy for, as he was saying, for change management and trying to release the information. And I think a lot of that led to the public mistrust about it because we couldn't get information out. And then the multiple sources of information also led to people didn't know who to go to for information. And then when you look at the fact that the normal sources of information and the most trusted sources of information when it comes to these types of pandemics and these types of even being in Georgia and the Centers for Disease Control, um, the experts in the industry were even being called into question. So people just did not know who to go to for information. And I think that further led to uh, that mistrust. Yeah, 
especially for me as a as a virologist, somebody who studies viruses, when the when the outbreak first happened, I was kind of like, well, and, and most people don't know this. Typically, virologists have an area of specialization, right? So I do um, influenza viruses, and I also do vector-borne viruses. So I was kind of like, this isn't even my lane. I'm just going to let you know the scientists and the public health people um, do what they're going to do and let it be that. And and as time moved forward, I saw so much misinformation, and I saw you know, my family was coming to me with all these questions and random videos and things like that. And I, I just, I realized that, you know, it might not be my area of expertise in research, but in terms of science, in terms of communicating with the public and um, trying to have everybody move in the right direction, that it was then my responsibility as someone who kind of understands um, both the, the way that it's communicated in the public through my public health training and then my virology training that it it was time for me to step in and, and help to combat the misinformation because it's been so strong and it's been so consistent and it's just one thing after another. Just to echo some of those um, comments, um, you know, this has been one of the first times where mathematical models have played a prominent role in the media in terms of trying to make projections and explain to individuals what's going on. Um, and so that's been that's been great and on one hand, but on the other hand, um, there's not a great understanding, I think, about what mathematical models are and what they can do and what their limitations are. And so communicating uh, effectively those results in a way that um, a broad audience is able to understand those, those limitations and, and strengths um, is really important. And so with, you know, as uh, others have said, changes in, of information over time. You know, as researchers, we're used to uh, our answers changing as we get new information, but I think that may not be something uh, that the general public is, is used to. And so seeing, you know, projections of models uh, being changed over time can also lead to that distrust. Add that, um, you know, COVID-19 is a public health crisis, obviously, um, but it's the first public health crisis that we have dealt with in the age of, you know, big data, in the age of social media. Um, and so, you know, while it, it is frustrating that we haven't been able to keep up with uh, COVID-19, um, it's also true that misinformation and, uh, you know, all sorts of weird theories, they spread very quickly uh, on social media, as quickly as the the correct information. And so this has been a huge problem in kind of uh, figuring out what's real and what's not about COVID-19. Uh, and also the lack of a clear message from, you know, uh, our trusted uh, sources uh, also makes it very difficult. So what is the truth? Um, this is kind of why we're all here is to kind of talk about um, what are the knowns and, and unknowns? Um, I know that some of the scientists on the panel have already kind of touched on how it's affected the um, scientific community, but um, as like the only clinician here, it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about how the hospitals were um, affected as well. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, the truth is we still don't know a lot about COVID-19 and we don't know a lot about how it affects individuals. Um, what we do know is the clinical course is very different uh, for various individuals, and we still have little information as to why. Some people have very mild symptoms and, you know, get better very quickly. Um, it, these tend to be younger, healthy people, but at the same time, a lot of young people are also getting very sick, and they're having ongoing symptoms for months and complications afterwards. A recent article suggested that uh, up to a third of people who have had COVID-19 have some structural heart damage afterwards. Um, so, you know, it's uh, something that is potentially very dangerous, right? There are a lot of people who do get COVID-19 and recover really, really well and don't have any immediate symptoms, but it's hard to tell at this point because it's so new. I mean, it feels like we've been in this for a long time, but in reality, it's only been about four months. Um, and it's something that's so new that we really are kind of at that point where we're still figuring out treatments, uh, best practices. Um, and trying to, you know, collect as much information as we can to tackle this thing going forward. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, I would really like to know, especially from our mental health providers, how COVID-19 has impacted us in terms of the mental health in the Black community. Um, and my question more specifically is, do you think the current pandemic 
um, and the sort of safety precautions taken um, thus far have sort of created an incubator almost for mental health issues. That's an excellent question, Linnell. I think that as the scientists and doctors have spoken to around the changing and evolving nature of information, which is perfectly normal in research, having to sort through all of that for someone who isn't trained in those fields and how to contextualize all of that different information can be really challenging. There was also mention of a lot of misinformation, and I think that part of what can be missing from some of these conversations is, although people have mentioned trust, and I think that the historical relationship between medical institutions and the black community uh, has been characterized for good reasons with mistrust. And so I think that when you are being asked to alter your life in really significant ways for information that from your perception keeps changing and, and you don't have a way to contextualize it, to understand it, then that can be really troubling. And I think coming back to your question of, is this an incubator for mental health issues? I think that's really well worded. And I, one of the things that I've, I've thought a lot about is loneliness and how there is a study that compares the, the health impact of loneliness to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And so I think that with social distancing, social isolation, also having to although some people will say physical distancing, m making these really significant changes, not having access to touch, and things that help regulate our nervous systems, those, those impacts aren't always considered when directives are given. So I absolutely think that it can have an impact on mental health. And particularly when, when you're in the, the having to choose between going to work and feeling like you're putting yourself and other people at risk or staying home and doing your part, I think that's a horrible bind to be in. So why has this pandemic sort of impacted the black community in particular or minority communities in particular? Could all of you guys sort of comment on maybe some of the cultural or systemic or historical factors that may have made us more susceptible um, and also possibly comment on what factors might make it harder for our community to take care of both our physical and mental health during this time and possibly in the future. I think one of the big issues and you kind of touched on it on kind of trust with those particular communities is uh, representation of scientists in those particular communities. So how can you trust someone if you don't know where they're from or what they're about? Um, and when people don't see representation of people that look like them in various STEM fields or you know, social health fields or any of these particular fields, then they're less likely to distrust the people who are giving them uh, those particular messages. Uh, so I think there's a really big disconnect between connecting uh, kind of what's happening at on the STEM level, co connecting what's kind of happening at the research level and getting that information down to potentially uh, leaders in a lot of these particular communities that, you know, might not have a their local scientist to really go to and might, you know, the doctor in their area might not look like them. Uh, so it's, there's this just kind of disconnect with, uh, with, with that particular avenue. So I think it's one of the, I think the burden is more even on us, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to say, like, you know, give scientists uh, and scientific communicators more to do, you know, it's like, I'm working on the cure, it's, it's hard enough trying to deal with all this misinformation, I'm, I got to do all this other stuff too, but it is our job to actually communicate our science to the public, it is our job to, you know, make sure that those, uh, those messages are as clear and concise as we can possibly make them, and then it's our job to hopefully hand them off to people who can represent those particular messages within those particular communities. So I think that we need to find those people in those communities, find, you know, HBCU Network is a great opportunity for that. I mean, it's, it's connecting those particular communities. It's connecting those people, connecting with those local newspapers to make sure that those messages get out. Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a long haul for all of this. And it's something that we just need to, you know, hunker down and just, you know, and, and, and do it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, in, in thinking about why this has impacted minority communities, Black community so much, it, I mean, it kind of all boils down to racism, right? Like, um, health disparities in general typically have more to do with racism in the medical field and, um, you know, people going in and not being the lead when they have symptoms or um, more environmental things. So um, people living in food deserts are more likely to have diabetes or um, exposure to environmental toxins, those sorts of things. Um, and so those things already existed, right, before COVID, um, before SARS coronavirus 2 came, came onto the scene. And then you throw this... Um, I guess it's exacerbating virus on top of it. And basically it's just, it's just showing us all of these things that were there, but maybe kind of hidden or things that we didn't really talk about before, but now we have to talk about it because it's something new. It's something we can't control. And it's a little bit harder to, to tuck away um, more so than the things that are already built in structurally into the medical system that, that are there and that exist. Um, and I think, uh, with the current political climate too, that also throws in some things because, um, you know, there's less trust, I think, uh, in our communities for the government in general, but then you also have on top of it, um, you know, a president who doesn't openly, but doesn't really like re rebuke per se, like white supremacists and, and all of those things. And so then you have, even when you do have a message coming out of that government, are you going to believe it when you already see all the other contributing factors? Um, there. And so I think all of those things have kind of just made this perfect um, storm, I guess, of, of what we're seeing now. Yeah, just There's also, oh, okay. uh, I just tag on to what Dr. Taylor was saying. Um, what she was discussing a little bit are what I consider the social determinants of health. Um, when you think about food deserts, when you think about access to care, when you think about access to schools and, and education and, and jobs and transportation, uh, transportation to get you to the doctor, um, those are all social determinants of health. And, and neighborhoods where, unfortunately, a lot of Black people live are disproportionately affected by social determinants of health. This is a consequence of a lot of things in our past, like redlining. Um, this is a consequence of uh, racism, essentially. Um, and then you compound that with the, the historical distrust of the system because of like the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, things like that. In addition to the fact that the clinical environment has totally changed during COVID. So before when you could go with your mom to the emergency department and, and sit there and, you know, talk to the doctor, you can't do that anymore. Um, and so this is, you know, if you don't know what's going on inside um, the ER and we're sending you home because we don't have enough test kits to go around and we're telling you to self-quarantine, but you're not able to self-quarantine uh, because you live with your family, right? Because you live in an area that does not have, you know, has been disproportionately affected by the social determinants of health, then we're just creating a, an a issue with, with the ability of Black people to trust the medical system. And that has been so compounded in COVID for, for all of these reasons. I was just going to mention that um, uh, Black individuals are also disproportionately represented in, uh, in jobs that are considered essential right now. And so that's also increasing their exposure and contacts, um, whereas you know, others might be able to more easily isolate. Um, and then for those who aren't uh, essential but may have lost their jobs, um, then that just exacerbates any um, issues that they already had underlying. I think the, the beauty of my role is that I, I'm able to share a message with medical professionals about how to care for the Black community. But I also have the, the role of caring for the medical professionals, too, that have been working through COVID and helping them through their own self-care. And so one of the messages, though, that I have been sharing with them is the need not only for empathy during this time when they are caring for Black and Brown communities, but also the need for compassion. Because I think one of the things that is lacking during this time is what during any time is just the need for compassion. When you are dealing with people of color and when you are dealing with Black and Brown communities, you need to have a level of compassion because there is mistrust. And when you talk about, especially mental health, because 
mental health even more than we already know that our physical health comes with disparities, but we go and we seek mental health help even less. And so when you think about this, we want to ensure that the medical professionals have a level of compassion when you're dealing with individuals in minority spaces and in minority environments. And in Georgia, one of the things that we are really looking at is how we provide mental health help during this time and how we make not only it safe, but also how we create mental health help that is relevant and it is compassionate and it meets them at their needs. So really thinking about that. And one of the things that I shared with them is that you're not healing them. You want black people to heal and to hope, but you're not healing them from their blackness. You're helping them to heal from the atrocities that have been committed against them. And sometimes I think that um, people of other, and especially clinicians of other races, don't, do not understand that. You're not healing them from their blackness. You're healing them from the things that have been committed against them because they are black. You're not healing them from their blackness. And I think so many times that comes across. So black people are especially resistant to mental health help because they think you're coming at them with that in mind. And so that's one of the messages that I have been carrying to our medical professionals that are of other persuasions to make sure that you have that understanding that when you're going into these communities that you're not coming at them from that angle. I agree. Um, can I get a couple words in? Yes, I, um, I appreciate you guys and your level of expertise. And I just wanted to say that um, the black community also, and from my standpoint, speaking from HBCU Nation and having been educated at an HBCU and having all of the students that had to go home, they are black too. And a lot of them, most of them don't come from privilege. So they're going back to the neighborhoods that have the disparities. They come from those neighborhoods for the most part. So I guess a lot of them have to kind of be the voice of reason for those that don't believe in wearing the masks or don't believe in what they're hearing about, you know, the measures that they can take to be more safe. And, uh, that's something that I was curious as to what some of you may have experienced when dealing with people that have become infected, particularly our black community. Um, and I, I compare it to using an umbrella when it's raining. I mean, people do that. <laughs> you don't have to make them put the umbrella up. But I'm curious as to why is it so difficult to get people to do some of the basic things like the mask and the social distancing, which doesn't cost anything. I know there are costs associated with other stuff, but social distancing doesn't cost anything <laughs> in a mask. You may you can make one of those out of a towel if you need to. So I'm just curious to get some insight on that one. Uh, one concern that I read about recently with the cloth mask recommendation by the CDC is this fear by some black men that it will um, increase the likelihood that they're perceived as being criminals. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's, that's one contributor anyway to this um, resistance, possibly wearing a mask, a cloth mask anyway. Dr. Colvin, to come back to your phrasing of the question, I think the phrasing holds part of the answer. You said people who don't believe in wearing masks. And I think for me, that really does come to how much our perceptions shape our behavior. And again, returning to this issue of trust, I think there is the social determinants and history and where people live and who gets sicker, but then there's also the idea of 
when I step in, when I'm at the threshold of a medical system or a doctor's office, there's so many studies that speak to a different quality of treatment for black communities. And so I think that for me in my own personal COVID journey, although I tend to lead towards rule following, so I, I definitely was following those guidelines without the understanding. There were two conversations I had, one with a friend that I've known since kindergarten, who's a doctor, who was able to contextualize the advice that was being given. And then another one was with a scientist who said, oh, this, this is why things are changing. Talk to me about droplets. And then so that kind of turned my internal belief. There was one phase of just doing it because I was being told and I didn't want the $300 fine in Massachusetts or interaction, unnecessary interaction with the police system. But then there was another, there was another part of it. It's like, now I really understand why this is important. And I think that I, I feel tremendously privileged to have access to those kinds of people in my social life, but I know that that's definitely not the case for everyone. No, it's not. And I think one of the things that I guess I, I've tried to wrestle with is the fact that you can feel the rain, you can see the rain. You can't see the COVID droplets nor feel them, but they have such an impact. So I guess I, I want people to believe that it's true. And I, I think what we're seeing is that some people don't believe that it's true until it impacts them, such as Dr. Mays and, and her loss. You know, I don't know the circumstances around it, but nevertheless, there was a loss and there are losses all day, every day. And I don't get when people are going to just get on board and say, OK, we need enough is enough. And again, if the perception is that this system doesn't care about me, this system has historically mistreated people who care, who look like me. If I need help from this system, I'm rolling the dice if they're going to answer me or not. And they're, they're only trying to control me with this myth, then that is going to influence behavior. From a, from a mental health perspective, you know, we have a lot of students who had internships promised to them this summer. Some had jobs. Some actually went out and bought the car, had the job rescinded. And these, this has happened to thousands of students across the country and, and speaking specifically of African Americans. Um, I'm, I wonder whether from a behavior health perspective, will there be enough behavior health specialists or psychologists, what have you, to handle what it's about to unleash or have already unleashed. Anyone want to respond to that? I think part of my answer, the short answer is no, I don't think there will be enough. Uh, specifically, we're talking about enough in, in representative terms. The, the only other thing I would add is this term called the ambiguous loss that was coined by an American psychologist named Pauline Voss, and she used it to refer to losses that are hard to put to, to name precisely. Uh, and some of them may be secret, some of them, again, may be ambiguous, not clearly defined. And I think that with COVID, we're dealing with so many losses that are hard to name. Some of them may be not being able to go back to school or start a new job. Some of them are, are very clearly defined when we lose people in our lives, but then there's some of them that are still unknown, similar to the scientific impacts that we're still understanding uh, the, the long-term impacts of some of some of the impacts mm -hmm. of COVID. Yeah, I think um, as I'm listening to this conversation, we're missing kind of another piece and um, someone from the audience actually just kind of brought it up, um, but we really haven't, you know, sort of defined and talked about our blackness. Uh, I think, um, Professor uh, Prosper and like Deborah touched a little bit on the police brutality uh, piece of it, but um, I think we should also like sort of define and like talk about Black Lives Matter and like the way in which this has sort of impacted the way that we sort of uh, engage in this pandemic as well. So for instance, you know, for some reason out of, you know, Black Lives Matter has like existed for a long time, racism has existed for God knows how long, um, but what led up to kind of like this sort of like global support and why do people still choose to protest um, in a way? Uh, are we more susceptible? Are we putting ourselves more at risk? Do we have to continue to sort of like fight between this balance between protecting myself, but also recognizing the fact that I'm a black person in America? Um, if anyone wants to comment on that, um, that would be great. Um, in particular for the mental health providers, um, you know, thinking about, you know, black folks who are also like, 
dealing with these issues, this issue of racism, this pandemic of racism in a way I, I'd like to call it, um, and struggling with like these mental health issues um, in addition to this like current BLM movement, we see people getting like, you know, stolen and like taken away in unmarked cars, et cetera. Um, so it, I feel like we're almost in a dilemma and it's almost as if we can't necessarily navigate this pandemic in the same way everyone else is because we're not only dealing with, you know, protecting ourselves from COVID-19, we're also dealing with um, having our sort of humanity ripped away from us. I think, so that was, there are many pieces to that question. Um, but I think that um, as far as like looking at Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd protests and how those have kind of continued um, over time, we have not really seen an uptick in uh, COVID-19 cases because of the protests. Um, and so I think if anything, that shows you that the interventions work, right? So we, we, the messaging was wear your mask, wash your hands, you know, social distance, you're outside. Uh, if you do all of those things, you can protest fairly safely. And I think that that has been overwhelmingly the evidence and the data that we've seen. And I know that there are people who are working on um, tracking that and, and releasing the publications to kind of to back that up. Um, and so I think at least that piece of being able to respond to police brutality in that way, I don't think that that has been taken away from us if we follow those precautions. And so it kind of comes down to kind of like looping into the previous question, if, if people are taking this seriously and they're doing what they need to do um, to protect themselves from COVID, I think in a regular setting, being outside and, and protesting you know, our, our rights, I don't think that that's uh, necessarily a problem. Um, I think as a black person, as someone who has been dealing with this pandemic, I think when, when all of that exploded, I was just like, so I have to do both of these things now? Like it's just, <laughs> right? Like, um, and so it, from, from um, I guess like an academic perspective, it, it then turned into all of these conversations that I have been dying to have with, you know, colleagues and fellow students and um, professors and all those types of things for years, because like you said, Black Lives Matter has been here for, since I was in graduate school getting my PhD. And um, I, in conversation with my girlfriends, all we all went to graduate school together. Um, we've kind of just said, you know, I think the difference now is that there's more support for it because people aren't working, right? People are home, they can pay attention to the news. They um, maybe kind of sort of have more bandwidth to deal with it, at least um, from the perspective of those who are working at home and who aren't working on the front lines. And so I think it's a lot easier to ignore when you're in the hustle and bustle of your everyday life whatever that looks like. And then now that everyone, the world kind of just stopped for a couple of months and everyone was able to really like turn their vision to it. And I think that's why um, it's gotten more support. I think people don't have anything else to distract them from it. And I think um, that that has been a good thing. And I don't know that we would have seen that without the pandemic, um, but it's definitely taken a toll to have to, to kind of switch gears twofold on top of them, like trying to do what you would normally be doing outside of that. I think that, first of all, the mental health effects of kind of the combined COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter on the Black community um, has, is profound, right? Because uh, there have there been multiple surveys, one by the Washington Post, one by NBC, that said that Black people are actually more likely than people of other races to know somebody personally, who's affected by COVID-19. And I think that we can even see this on this panel, right? We know people that have been affected by COVID-19. Um, we have friends, we have family uh, that this has happened to. Um, and so when you think about um, that, and when you think about the people that are protesting uh, in Black Lives Matter, they tend to be more, a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more open to the science. Um, it seems that the people who are participating in Black uh, Lives Matter they did a really good job of, of wearing masks and social distancing, and we have not seen that uptick in cases yet. And so when you're thinking about what should you do, because I saw a question in the audience, what should you do to prevent from getting COVID-19? The best you can do is, you know, the th basic things, you know, wear a mask, do your best to, you know, stick to your close circle of friends, wash your hands, try not to touch your face. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing special about this, but for healthcare providers working in the hospital, this is, these are the only protections that we essentially have. And even though some healthcare providers have gotten sick, hospitals that have managed to maintain their stocks of PPE, maintain mask wearing, uh, implement correct procedures to 
wash and disinfect, um, the rates of infection amongst workers have been really low. So I think that's encouraging for us as, uh, as a community to just keep doing the things that we're doing to, to um, address COVID-19. I think also from a, a mental health perspective, coming back to what Dr. Taylor said about, we have to do both of these things at once. When I think about trauma and the, the study of trauma in North America, it was rooted in witnessing violent death with soldiers returning from war. And so I think a lot about the videos and how much black death there is in the imagery. I've had a lot of conversations with people about watching the videos or not, about protesting or not, about feeling compelled to take some form of action and feeling at the same time that that action was insufficient. And so I think it's perfectly normal when observing, when hearing about these stories to have a range of emotions, including rage, helplessness, fear. I think there's something that's also very threatening about witnessing all of the death that we have as a community. I'm thinking back to the times in America and the when there was postcards of lynching victims being sent and that when I think about how many hands had to touch those to put them up in the store, somebody purchased it, wrote on it, sent it, delivered, and that practice stopped in the early 1900s. And so I think that, um, and, and that was definitely more of a warning and, and there was this normalcy of imagery of black death and so i think that as as comforting as it is to know that that witnessing this death has mobilized so many people to actions and organizational change it's also horrifying to think that some people are rejoicing in this and that it's functioning on two different levels that it's scary it's really really scary to see people dying who are crying out and begging for their lives saying that they can't breathe Chiquita, did you have something? No. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, I guess we have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, and so I, I definitely want to sort of transition to our sort of like conversation about what can we do. Um, so one thing that uh, has come up a lot um, in the conversation that we've had today is this sort of handling, you know, dealing with misinformation. Um, so what are some ways we can like further find ways to like educate our community about not only how to protect themselves, but better strategies for deciphering information um, that we hear on the news. So I'll give you an example. Um, I think I mentioned this once before. Um, as a scientist, when I see a headline that says, hey, uh, this study says, uh, that it found X, Y, Z, my initial reaction is, oh, that study found that. But to the general public, that can seem like it's absolute truth and this is what we should follow. So how do we sort of get these sorts of skills that we've developed because of the professions that we've decided to choose to do um, out to our community? And what are some other ways we can better educate and better facilitate this kind, these kinds of conversations um, in our community with regards to health, with regards to science, with regards to mental health? I think one of the things here is understanding, quote unquote, what that the system is that you're trusting to get uh, to give out all this data. I think when we talk about the system, we're incorporating all of government in that particular system. And there's a lot of different entities within that particular government that make a lot of different decisions that at least these days seem to be contradicting themselves. So as far as a system that I'll explain to you is it's it's the scientific system it's the grant system so um i don't know that other people actually understand this but this is a, this is trust me this is an important point for scientific communication uh if i find a really cool discovery in my laboratory it doesn't mean that i get a raise on the contrary it, it, i don't get anything I, I i get a pat on the back and my my, my institution says that's really good you helped mankind and that's, that's, the, that's the gratification, that's the carrot that we do get. Um, so I don't know if you all know this, but if I want to actually do some research on say COVID, say bacteria, a virus, heart disease, all of these things, if I wanna do, do any of these things, I basically write this, what ends up being a 60 page proposal to a governmental scientific agency. And only about 10% of those get funded for, me, for those people to do their research. So it is competitive. And when I get a grant, that doesn't go as a bonus money to me. Nope, 
that goes to, so I can hire people and buy material so I can do the research. So there's this misconception that this basic science and this general science and a lot of this research is, oh, you're just doing that for the money. You're just get, you know, doing that for the money. I've had so many people come to me saying, I have this copper product. Oh, can I put this copper in a mask? Can you look at my copper socks? I could have walked away from this situation a millionaire, but you know, ethics. Um, so I think that it's really important to, if we're trying to make that, con uh, to, that connection to who to trust, you need to understand what those entities that we're coming from are. So when you see things from the NIH, when you see things from the CDC, those things are actually reputable sources. Those things is, are things that as scientists we trust. We get mad at them and we, talk, we yell at them when they have uh, information that might not be correct. And you know what they do? They use those things to actually change their information to make it more uh, accessible, more correct to the public. So that's, that's the system when we're saying the scientific system in which we're talking about. We're not talking about the executive branch. We're not talking about the judicial branch. We're talking about the scientific system of who to trust in this particular situation. And in doing so, I think that if you understand what those confines are, what you understand what those rules are and how we do our research and how we, you know, again, are doing it not to make money, but to actually, I mean, nobody goes into a research career at a university to get rich. I'm telling you that now, it's, it's, it's not a thing. Uh, we do it because we care about the problem and we care about the communities that those problems are affecting. Um, yeah, I think, I, and I, I also wanna point out, I think um, as far as when you see something that says a study has said this, um, when you conceptualize what a study is, depending on what it is, if it's a clinical trial or it's maybe even like some basic research, it's literally like one project. So if you look at a clinical trial paper, it'll say maybe we gave 500, well, it, it, they'll give you a sample size. They'll say how many people have been involved in this study, right? And um, kind of the rule of thumb that I go by is typically if one study is making a very large claim, it's likely, or the, 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 the article that's covering the um, the study is making a large claim that's likely inaccurate and doesn't actually go back to what the study is saying because typically we don't, as scientists, we don't make um, extremely large claims off one project. Um, it's usually a, a culmination of multiple project, projects that reinforce um, that, that piece of information that we're trying to share. Um, and then on top of that, I would say it's also kind of a language barrier. So I know in public health, we speak in terms of risk, right? And so I've had this conversation with my family 20 times already since the pandemic started. Just because something has less of a risk doesn't mean that you are not going to get sick. It just means that like, so if, it, if 20 people uh, hang out in the backyard and the risk is um, like one to 10 that someone is not going, that you're not going to get sick, that means that one out of every 10 people is still possibly going to get infected. So you might not be one, one of that one person or you might be that one person. And so, Understanding when someone says the, the risk is lower if you're going to a barbecue outside as compared to eating indoors, there's still, a, there, there still is the potential for infection. It's just less than if you're eating indoors. And so I think um, from the public perspective, you hear less risk and you're like, oh, bet, it's on. Like, let's do it. It's good. There's no problem. But that's not what it means. And so um, I, I, personally, I've gotten into arguments with my, with my family because they're like, oh, we're going to go outside and eat at this restaurant on the patio. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. And they're like, why? I don't understand why you're being so, you know, stringent on it. Like, because there's still a risk. It's just a lower risk. And I don't know if everybody else is going to be out there. We don't know what they're doing. And so it's still, even, even, even though the messaging is to go out and to stimulate the economy and do what you're going to do, understand that that's not for us. That's for people to line their pockets, right? That's for people to, to make money. But that's not necessarily going to benefit the individual person. And so ultimately, you still have to move in a way that protects you from the potential dangers, um, as opposed to kind of following the, the broad messaging at the current point in time that's being pushed. Just it's adding to this. To here too, that our research and our recommendations from that research was never intended for the general public. It was always for the organizations that hired us to, or that commissioned that research. It was never for to be released on social media or to the news 
news, mainstream news. It was for those scientific bodies that commissioned that research. And so now we're in this environment where this research is being put out to just mainstream media. And so we're in a, a, we're in a very different dynamic right now. And we need to rein that in, control that. And we need now to find ways to release the right information or at least the information, package it in the right way for mainstream media and for the general public. I want to get a chance to like uh, take one of the questions from the audience. So an audience member named Willie Mays mm -hmm. asked, um, are there any studies to show uh, what those that have beat COVID-19 had in common, such as better health, strong immune systems, blood type, et cetera, since there is no cure, what data shows us that our likelihood of surviving will increase? Because we're so early, early on, on um, it is really hard to find a lot of studies that prove the same thing. Um, we're all scientists here, and we all understand that the process of doing the research, um, analyzing the data, and then, you know, then writing and publishing the paper can be a long one, right? It's, it is actually quite remarkable that we have any studies out on this at all right now, uh, because before COVID, um, you know, the barrier to entry to getting a study published was, was probably much higher. Um, so unfortunately, because we don't have the data on what it means to beat COVID or uh, who is able to kind of uh, not get as sick, it's really just better to be safe, right? Um, because people may think at this point that you, they have beat COVID um, and then have a reinfection later on in, uh, in life. Uh, it could come back like shingles. Um, we don't know the effect on somebody who, say, for example, was pregnant during COVID uh, and contracted COVID uh, on the unborn child because it hasn't been long enough. Like I said, it's only been four months. Um, and to carry a child to term is, is nine months. Uh, we find that a lot of people are continuing to test positive even after their symptoms resolve. Um, and so unfortunately, um, even though there are some very early preliminary studies from places like China and stuff like that, we can't say for sure what you can do. What we do know for a fact is that, you know, if you are older and if you have multiple other comorbidities that weaken your immune system, that you are more likely to pass away from COVID. Uh, and this affects our community in a, in a more profound way because of the previous inequities that have led us to have uh, diabetes, hypertension, and kidney disease at a higher rate than the rest of the U.S. population. So there's one thing about uh, a lot of these studies, and, uh, and Andrew said it uh, very well, uh, but I would also caution us to, you know, if you see one of those, you know, those studies, you have to be able to look at it with a critical eye. And this is not something that scientists can do for you. This is something that you have to do for yourself. Case in point, did you know that bald men are more likely to get COVID? They're in a higher, they're in a group that is more likely to get COVID. And you look at that, you're like, oh my gosh, I might be balding. I might, but when you like break down that study, you look at people who are, you know, aging more are more likely to be bald. And then you, what you're actually looking at is the data saying that, oh, people who are elderly are more likely to, to get COVID. You're not looking at bald. You're not looking at some of these other things. So a lot of what we're doing is like, we're looking at genetics, we're looking at blood type, we're looking at socioeconomic status, we're looking at who your cousins are. We're looking at all of this particular data to try and see if there are any trends whatsoever in this. And as Andrew put, the, the only uh, thing is, if you have comorbidities or if you're in an age population, if you're immunocompromised, those are the vulnerable populations. And as a community, uh, in addition to thinking of those and looking at those particular studies it, with a critical eye, it's our responsibility to, to take care of them. It's our responsibility to do what we can to be there for them. And what, the, what are those things? It's just washing your hands, physically distancing, wearing a mask. It's better safe than sorry. If you're like, oh my gosh, I wore a mask for six months and you know, the government was controlling me doing that, but I didn't die, hmm, I would say that's a good day. 
And there's very strong evidence now that there's pre-symptomatic transmission and asymptomatic transmission. And that's why it's so important for everyone, regardless of um, whether you feel like you might be ill, uh, to practice these physical distancing measures and wearing a cloth mask and, and uh, washing our hands and things like that. Um, so it's not, we don't have to be in that population as, as uh, Dr. Johnson is saying to um, feel that we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect uh, others. Um, and we really have no idea of knowing um, whether we could be infectious. Wrap up. Um, I have, oh, Dr. Marshall, do you have something else to say? Great. We're going to wrap up. I do have one last question uh, for the panelists. Um, so for each of you, what do you hope we will learn from our current situation? Um, and what solutions do you hope will be implemented in our communities in the coming months or years? You can take like a few moments to kind of talk about that or answer that question. Um, that would be great. Um, I would love to see uh, some more of like the black media outlets encouraging science communication um, from other black scientists. So like, you know, maybe something like Essence or um, along those lines, maybe picking up like a, a column that talks that has a scientist that answers questions, Q and A's, um, just to kind of start to build that relationship within the community. So that way, the next time we have um, a similar situation like this, there's already you know, at least some go-to people that we have that we can be like, okay, well, I know that they've been, you know, breaking down scientific studies for the last year or two. Hopefully we go at least a year or two between the next pandemic. Um, but, but um, right, so that then um, not only are you building that relationship, but then we're kind of disseminating into the community how to better decipher these studies. Like, what does a breakdown look like? Um, those, I think, I think that would be, a really good thing to come out of this because um, I mean, even before this was happening, I know um, Danielle Lee, um, who is um, a mammologist, she has kind of talked about this. Like the, we tend to, in, in those types of things, go like let celebrities and stuff talk about their, the, the most recent health craze or those sorts of things. And we never really ask like the scientists or the, the actual doctors and stuff, what they think about these like latest health trends and, fads and all of those sorts of things when we're the ones who have the training. And I think that developing those relationships would just be something that would be really good and really nice to see and we would benefit from. May I jump in? Yes, and, and thank you. And I agree. And that's what uh, HBC Smart TV, I didn't give you the full name of it, but that's what we call it, HBC Smart TV. And you don't have to be from an HBCU obviously, but interested in our community as a whole and uh, we are building that particular platform for that purpose and like I said earlier there are so many little pockets of people talking about different things but it is very important that we be become that trusted source we have the capabilities as African Americans to do the work obviously so let's get it done. One of the things I think about in relationship to this question is the idea of ruptures in therapy. And that's when a client feels for whatever reason that I missed something that they said, or maybe I, I caused harm or did something that was not helpful to them. And we spend a lot of time in our education talking about how to repair those ruptures because that relationship depends on vulnerability and openness. And when I think about uh, relationships with the policing system, with the medical institution, there have been so many ruptures that continue to happen that have gone unaddressed. And I think that part of the solution is on a systemic level, I think particularly with policing, when we get into the, the morality of the, the police officers or the victims, because of course we all know good cops, but that's not the issue. The issue is really looking into a system um, that allows for conditions for these kinds of killings to happen. So I think that something needs to change on the systemic level. And then I also think that conversations like this can be really important, I think, in terms of translation, helping, you know, hearing what you're saying about the studies, and then what does that look like in our communities and why, and how can we communicate that most effectively? If I may, I and I know Linnell, you'll get into this, but I want to thank all of you for participating. Um, some of you during the course of the uh, pre 
preparation for this indicated that you had small children and you've been at home, you're trying to do your work. And uh, as we go, as we approach our next session next week, we're going to have uh, deal with a lot of social science or any types of things. For instance, we have a homeschool specialist who deals with every aspect of that, did a dissertation in that, and we're going to have some other folks. But uh, I know, I, I guess my question real quick is that how many of you right now are wondering uh, as far as uh, wondering about the, uh, about the manner in which you will school your kid or the manner in which you will have care for them. I mean, you guys are going through things right now and there's a lot of stress that you guys have taken upon yourself. Is that an issue? Just say, raise the hand. Is that an issue or anything? Okay. All right. So you want to tune in next week. <laughs> now. Um, any of the other panelists wanted to finish uh, answering the first question? jump back uh, and try to answer it. Um, you, you f I think the first thing you asked was, um, what do we hope to see? Um, and COVID-19 has placed such a spotlight on health disparities that already existed. What I hope to see specifically is people to recognize this widely, right? Just like people are recognizing that police brutality is based in racism and is the problem. Um, and for our country to actually come together and attempt to address these structural things that got us to the point where we are dying at a disproportionate rate. Um, I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing I'd like to see is uh, an improvement in our public health literacy, um, because a lot of people are asking questions. We're hosting panels like this. We're having these discussions, which I think is super important. Um, and because we're doing this, I mean, an improvement in our public health literacy will take us past COVID-19, right? It'll help improve the flu. It'll help improve everything else uh, kind of around the country, surrounding our communities. Um, and, and then I think the second part of the question is how do we hope to address this going forward? Um, and I just want to think that like the people on this panel, um, I don't know about you guys, but whenever my friends or family or anybody has a question, I try to be a source of information for them because uh, I don't fully understand what some of you guys do. Some of you guys in physics, some of you guys in you know, microbiology and stuff like that. Um, and I'm sure you don't quite understand what I do. Um, and so the way we look at studies and interpret information is probably different. So I definitely don't understand my friends who are not you know, in this field at all to kind of understand. So I try to, be, I try to empower friends and family to, uh, to understand the information and then to go out and tell other people the information, right? And I think that is kind of how we are going to get um, the spread. So I hope that everybody on this panel uh, has got enough information to be empowered to go out and to share what we have shared with you in order to kind of make this thing better and improve our public health literacy. Along those lines, I'm really interested in, in seeing an improvement in, in quantitative literacy. So I would love to see you know, more uh, students getting involved and in trying to develop their quantitative skills and understand that this is a very interdisciplinary problem. And so it's not just for mathematicians to be working on, it's not just for um, medical doctors to be working on, for example. Um, it really requires a broad set of skills um, and the ability to communicate across those disciplinary boundaries. Um, and so some, some of that is, is building up, you know, a little bit of, of um, qu quantitative literacy to be able to bridge that, um, to bridge that boundary. Um, and that will help with communicating things like, um, you know, what is a model? How, how do we, um, when we see a headline that says, you know, this model predicts this many uh, cases, what does that really mean? Um, you know, how do we actually go back to the literature and try to have some understanding for the context of that bold statement? Uh, one thing that I'd like to see to with this. Oh. Go ahead, Dr. Mace. No, go ahead. Um, I guess one thing that I would like to uh, see in this is uh, memes are great but they're not the go-to for scientific information. If you don't see a source, then you need to think twice. Uh, other than that, I agree with everything else that everybody has already said here. 
I agree with Dr. Johnson. I, I agree with everything. I think we need a, a well-funded um, black scientific think tank where there are black scientists and black professionals really dealing with issues that impact, uniquely impact the black community. And then to, I think we really need to kind of, we need some grassroots efforts just like this. So whereas we're doing this on a broad basis and it's kind of national, but we're all in different pockets and different places. And I think we kind of need to break this down and begin to have these conversations with black scientists in our own local areas and really just expand these talks and include people and just continue to educate and empower those in our communities. That's that everyone. All right, great. This was awesome. I want to first thank our panelists for agreeing to be a part of this. Um, we really do appreciate you guys. I'm actually looking for the little clap button if anyone has it um, that you can put on uh, Zoom. But thank you all for attending this. Um, and thanks thanks to the audience for attending. We, we had quite a few people come. You guys had really great questions. Um, it's interesting because one of the audience members brought up a think tank. And so the next part of our series um, uh, will include next week, uh, like Carl was saying earlier, um, a focus on like the social aspects and education in particular. Um, and so it would be uh, great if you guys can also tune into that uh, panel as well. And our very, very last part of our series, like we'll actually include a think tank uh, where we will like bring together teams to think about um, solutions that can be implemented in our communities. We do have some very limited funding, but funding no less uh, for uh, some seed to seed some of the projects Projects that might come out of this. Um, but ultimately, even if we get great ideas and connect good people together that are willing to like be passionate about implementing things into our community, um, that would be great. I also want to um, thank Desna and Alex. Alex had to run out of here, but they've been working behind the scenes. Uh, Desna is a graduate student at University of Michigan, um, and Alex is also a graduate student um, at uh, Harvard University, who's been helping a lot uh, behind the scenes with the panel. Um, and lastly, I want to thank Carl and Trina so much for being so supportive of this panel and the series itself. Um, if you guys have any final remarks, please, please, you know, go right ahead and do so. Otherwise, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I just want to say it was an amazing panel and I appreciate all of you guys and, and there was some great comments about the think tank and all of that. And so I'm excited for the next one. And um, hopefully we will definitely, definitely build upon this.